Charles Rocket is a name you may not recognize, but you've likely seen his face in 90s classics from Dances with Wolves to Dumb and Dumber and Hocus Pocus. Rocket's tumultuous life and career came to a screeching halt on October 7, 2005, when he was found dead in his driveway with two self-inflicted stab wounds to the neck. How did we get here? That's today on Death in Entertainment. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God! Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. Ah! What do you call this thing anyway? Death in entertainment. Hello, hello, hello. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mic check one, two, one, two. Mic check one, three. Are What's we plugged up? in? <laughs> yeah, we are. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Oh, thank God. I could hear you last time, too. This is take two <laughs> of the Rocket Sode. Uh, we tried to record it before uh, the holiday break, but I did not have any of the microphones plugged into my computer. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was You're a bummer. A little, little behind the scenes here <laughs> of the podcast of what what goes on here. Yeah, and what how Kyle is trying to fuck us up all the time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Got to bring us down a notch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we are more knowledgeable in this subject now, having gone through it. Yeah, we already. sure are. We lived and learned. Yeah, yeah. Well, also in the subject of Charles Rocket. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we're well versed because yeah. we literally <laughs> did this already. Yeah. So we're proficient in the death of Charles Rocket. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And plugging a microphone in. Yes. Well, you know, like too. we'll play it by ear with that one. <laughs> Two skills you need in life. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be an idiot. Well, you know, like I said, you live and learn, and uh, we're on our way. We're gonna we're gonna do it here, and we're gonna crush this one. That's right. Yeah. And this episode will be taking us to October seventh. 2005. What? Okay. Uh, October 7, 2005, the top five songs around this time. Number five, My Humps by the Black Eyed Peas. My Humps, My Lady a classic Humps. If I that ever song heard. was everywhere. Check it yeah. out. <laughs> my Humps, My Humps. Uh, yeah. 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 Wasn't there a picture of uh, Fergie that when she pissed herself and stuff on stage and it was just like she was dancing in a pissed on uh, outfit? Oh, I forgot that she did that. that Remember was, that? Yeah. She she pissed herself in the middle of a concert, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember that. And the show went on, correct? The show must go uh, on. It yeah. must. <laughs> <laughs> she, she finished in urine-drenched glory. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not as... If she pissed herself, that's one thing. I mean, kind of embarrassing. But that chick from uh, the jazz version of Rage Against the Machine... I forget the name of this the band, but what? she just pissed on an audience member's face. Oh yeah, oh, I saw yeah. that video. That was wild. <laughs> Last that was summer, in Daytona. Yeah. That yeah. was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And then she had to post like an Instagram thing, like, "I'm sorry, I got carried away." Yeah, <laughs> I got carried away. <laughs> you think? If she yeah. got carried away, what about the audience member that let her do it? I know he was like, "Yeah, I'm loving this." He's like, "Guys, yeah. take a picture." He couldn't get enough piss. Yeah, the guy <laughs> likes his piss. Um, you know. Sophia Eurista. Eurethra. I believe her name is. That sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's not on my high on my list to no. get pissed on in front of a bunch of concert yeah, goers. No, do it in there private. is a list, but that's it's not high up on No. It. Do it at <laughs> That's home. like number 25, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, number four. Another classic photographed by Nickelback. Look at my photograph. Oh. Yeah. Take it, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, that's all I know. Okay, that's all anybody knows. That's, that's all, all the band know. Nickelback knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there aren't any other lyrics to that song. No, no. Yeah, people will find out. <laughs> not at all. Like You by Bow Wow. This I have no memory of. Do not remember it. I remember the Fergie piss. I remember my humps. <laughs> yeah. Not this one. It's like the, the JFK, uh, you know, what you knew where you, where you were when that happened. Yeah. Nine yeah. eleven. Yeah. <laughs> when Bow Wow came out with Like You. Um, number two is Shake It Off by Mar Mariah Carey. Shake it off. Not the Taylor Swift. Yeah, I guess a different rendition or a different wow. song. It was different an, song. Another Shake It Off. Yeah. Shake It Off. Oh, you, you remember it. Mm-hmm. 
Kyle just sings the name of the song. And he goes, yeah, yeah I know that song. Yeah, it I know sounds that one. suspiciously <laughs> similar to the Taylor Swift version. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, this one came out 10 years earlier. Shake it off. Shake it off. <laughs> What's the oh, difference? Oh, Kyle, you must be a big fan of that Mariah Carey. Mm-hmm. Number one, Gold Digger by Kanye West. Never heard of it. Yeah, right. <laughs> mm. Yeah, like you didn't sing along at the top of your yeah, lungs. Yeah, that was your anthem. In the man. car. Yeah. yeah. I only said the N word though. No, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Okay. We are edgy here oh, today, hey. folks. Coming out swinging. This is the edgy version of this uh, podcast. <laughs> yeah, that. That's the only word I know. The In anthem general. of 2005, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Because Ray was huge. And then Kanye brilliantly sampled Jamie Foxx from Ray. Yep. Oh, really? Yeah. Dang. Not even oh. Ray. Like Jamie Foxx from Ray. I didn't mm-hmm. realize and that. And the song was a smash. Yep. Yeah. I'm ready to go, nigga. I didn't realize that. But then they worked later on other stuff and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They worked together multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, and then Kanye at the same time, this was huge, went on TV saying jo- George Bush doesn't care about black people. That was oh, hilarious. During Katrina. Oh, my God. <laughs> Mike Myers' face oh. during that is the most priced. That should be an NFT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want that on my wall. Yeah. Just the look of fear in his face and complete shock, like, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> it was worse than when the love guru came out. <laughs> Mike Myers. The worst moment in history. Yeah. <laughs> well... Love Looking Guru. at the box office numbers from the Love <laughs> yeah. Guru. Yeah. Love Guru was slightly more embarrassing, yeah. I would yeah. say. <laughs> it's close. Though. Definitely more offensive. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. Indian people, they did not like that. No. I care for that. No, but but then again, nobody liked that movie. Not one person. No. There's, there's no no fan out there that's willing to die on that. The head. way yeah. Alejandro has quoted it, it made me think that he likes it, though. Yeah. No, or okay. Hold on. Hey. <laughs> yeah, he says Mariska Hargate to people as a greeting in it. It's brilliant. Yeah. And then she shows up. Brilliant, a, he says. And then she shows up and does a cameo. And so Mike Myers is like, Mariska Hargate, Mariska Hargate. <laughs> it was all worth it. That was the Big one moment off. I enjoyed in the movie. Really? I don't know if that classifies me as liking it. Well, he was just on fire. And he's like, I can do no wrong. Why don't I just do this weird movie about uh, uh, Indian Guru? And he's like, he found out. He fucked around and he found out. He fucked around and found out. <laughs> Not everything's Austin Powers. Exactly. Yeah, cat in the hat. Eh. Yeah. I like if he just quit after that. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Um, Smart move. Very smart. This was uh, for movies. This was the year of the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown and um, books. Oh, this is the books part. Yeah, Let me do that again. Sorry, I'm just very. No, excited. but you're not that wrong because the Da Vinci Code was about to be released, spring of 2006. Okay. So it's cooking. The, yeah, the press. This is also stuff I just I don't care about any Da Vinci Code anymore. Oh, I know. Dan Brown. I read it. I loved it, and I couldn't believe it was going to be a movie after really yeah you were one of those code breakers fuck yeah dude <laughs> that went around with the little <laughs> notebook and... mr brown will you sign my tit god damn right <laughs> yeah <laughs> will you sign my book will you sign my skateboard um okay what... so kyle's a fan yeah he's a he's brownhead a, he's a brownhead <laughs> okay let's um let me see five people you meet in heaven another big book also both of these books came out in 2003, and they're dominating the bestseller list in 2005 for some reason. Well, hmm. we noticed that before. A lot of yeah. books kind of stick around that bestseller list for they a while. They come back around. Yeah. Yeah. Come back, kids. On TV, number four, Grey's Anatomy. Never heard of it. Still mm. on for some fucking reason. Yeah. That Here's... must have been new then. Ellen Pompeo from Boston. Yeah. Yeah, from Med- Medford. Friend of Dave Russo. Really? Friend Who... of the show, Dave Russo. <laughs> yes. Local uh, comedian. Dave Russo, who no one probably knows on this, but they should. Okay? <laughs> they should. He's great. Great. Um, number three, Desperate Housewives. Yeah, that was uh, killing it at that time in the yeah. ratings. Yeah. Um, not a good show. I actually opinion. want to see the pilot. I didn't realize that the whole show starts with one of the Desperate Housewives killing themselves. Yeah. Oh, very, really? Very dark. Yeah, I had no idea. And then she narrates the entire series. Oh. That's yeah. a weird Yeah, it's not a premise. Bi- Ooh. That's me. Sorry. It's not a terrible show, though, Mark. Well, I never got into it also. Yeah. So. Desperate Househead. Yeah. Well, you got it. <laughs> it has some fun, dark elements to it. I like okay. that. If it was on like HBO Max, it'd probably be a lot darker. Because how dark can you get on ABC? I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Well, not not yeah. very at all. It's the family network. Yeah. So not very. Uh, number two, CSI. 
Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> that's my uh, who. That's the my original Roger C- CSI <laughs> or one the of original. The I guess the spin-offs. original. Yeah, the original with William Peterson. Was he the ma- the yes. first one? And then they brought in Dave Caruso. He was Caruso. Miami. He was Miami. CSI yeah. Miami. Yeah. yeah. Taking his sunglasses off in slow motion. Looks like we got a murder here. To the who. Yeah. Looks like yeah. the Grinch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Caruso is a weird actor in general. Yeah, he's a ginger. You can't trust him. Yeah. He was on NYPD Blue, which was immensely popular. And that, then yeah. he decides he's too big for the show. And went, really? on to do, went on to do his movie career, which you all remember. <laughs> Jade. <laughs> Jade. And, oh, uh, the chick in the poster that's like green. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Naked. Yeah. I remember that. What was the one with Nicolas Cage he was in? That was like his big other movie role. Oh, that... m- something death marked for. No, that's a Steven Seagal movie. Isn't death. It? In... So, something with color. I think it's death. Color of night. No, that was the. Uh, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. Yeah. Where Ice T's colors. Colors. <laughs> colors. Colors. He was trying to make a, a big movie. That's always the biggest mistake. Kiss of death. Kiss of death. I knew it was something death. That's always the biggest mistake. When you're on a hit TV show, everyone's like, well, <laughs> you know, this is definitely going to translate to movies, and then it just doesn't. Yeah. And they're like, uh, can I get back on the show? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Can but it, but it did for like, because I think it did for like all the ER people, a lot of them anyway. Mm-hmm. No, Wiley, not so much, but uh, George Clooney, obviously. Yeah, it can off. it can be a good move to leave for a film career if yeah. it works out. Yeah, yeah. But Caruso got a second chance with CSI Miami. Uh, yeah, and then uh, he's steady working since. Yeah, and now he's dead. No, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, number one, American Idol, Woo! which was okay. still killing it around then. Well, it was still kind of new. It was probably the fifth season. I think it came out ninety nine, two thousand. Was it like with uh, Ruben or something at that time? Ruben oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was the original three. Kelly Clarkson? Simon. Kelly Clarkson and Justin Guarino tied that year. Yeah. Or they came in first and second. She must have won, right? I think she might have won. the biggest yeah. star since. And then they tried to capitalize by making that movie from Justin to Kelly. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that is... that. <laughs> I, I've seen parts of it, and it's yeah. absolutely horrible. Oh, and, Justin looked like the Sideshow Bob kind of. He had that big, yeah, crazy Yeah, the hair. big fro, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was actually working at a post-production house in New York City in 2008, and he was the first celebrity that came in. So he's like the biggest celebrity I'd ever met wow. at that point. He was really nice. And um, now he actually, he's the guy that dresses like Prince and does the Dr. Pepper commercials. I'm he's like, he's like the aware. tiny guy. I don't know. I don't see a lot of commercials because I, oh, think okay. I stream everything now. Yeah. So it's been mean. like huge for the last like three or four years. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess I've been under a rock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, great. You okay. would never know it's him. He or care. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sensing that Kyle's kind of a Justin Guarini yeah, fan. Yeah, that's right. Guarina head. Yep. <laughs> and you were shitting on me for talking about Desperate guru, Housewives? From gu- Guru to Guarini. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Guru and Desperate Housewives. Yeah. yeah, you're a Justin Guarini fan. Hey, I admit it. I wanted I to win. see the Desperate Housewives pilot, and you were a wealth of knowledge. Okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> What do we got? What do we got here? What We've happened? got Charles Rocket, who you probably don't know by name. If you do, you're a fan, but you definitely know him by face. Great name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fantastic name. His name is actually Charles Clavery was his last name. Ah, Charles Clavery. There's no mm. Mr. and Mrs. Rocket that um, he came from. Mr. Clavery. Um, Sounds like one of your cousins in ireland (laughs) we can't have you matthew clavery yeah i like when people change their name because their their name's too irish yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) they gotta get some showbiz name like rocket that sounds i don't know i don't know if i'd go for rocket i'd go for like a porn you know that sounds like a porn name rather i'd go for something a little more subtle subtle than rocket yeah I'm excited to blast off. Blast off, Rockets. Oh, nice. For this episode. Hello. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Blast Off. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a bad energy drink or something. <laughs> I hope y'all are ready to rock it. it yeah. To the stratosphere. <laughs> exactly. With this. We got to add a laugh track. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
All right. All right. So where did he start? He started in Bangor, Maine, his life. He was born in Bangor, Maine. He was the son of Mary Aurelia and Sumner Abbott Ham Clavery. What the fuck? His His names (laughs) are incredible. His dad's nickname was Ham, apparently. Oh, in quotes. (laughs) Yeah, it was in quotes. I thought that was like an old family (laughs) name or something. Ham. 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 Yeah. (laughs) Do we know why he was called Ham? Uh, Because he's a fat piece of shit. (laughs) Whoa. Whoa. No, his dad was really a dick. Charlie's childhood was not great. Uh, From what we know about it is like literally... His family was like super religious, and I feel like that's how all like the boomers and the pre boomers were just like total assholes. Yeah, kids were meant to be seen, not heard. Mm -hmm. Just like get out of my face, or I'll beat you. Well, wasn't that the generation of a lot of people in that generation became serial killers or the kids of that generation Mm, for sure? Yeah, and I I think there was like a there's books about it that I I obviously didn't read, but uh, (laughs) (laughs) that that kind of documents like that generation became. Like the the most socially insane and like yeah. you know murderers and you name it are in yeah. that generation. So bad news. Yeah. So Charles Clavery was born on uh, August twenty eighth, nineteen forty nine, in Bangor, Maine. <laughs> His parents were Ham and Mary Clavery. Uh, he was the third son born in a. A quick succession. So, like, uh, he was the fifth of eight children, but he was the third of, like, the middle three. Eight children. Yeah, there are eight kids total. His mom's vagina was destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. They Uh, could live in it. Yeah. So, the three kids he was the youngest of in that eight were Jim, Lincoln, and Charlie. And they all shared a bedroom. They would share everything from food to clothes, same bath water, school friends, everything. Oh, God. Um, Bathwater and school friends. Yeah. Like, it's all over the map here. Yeah. <laughs> all at once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so they never really had an identity either. What kind of identity? Just any. As a person, they were called Jim Link Charlie. All of them. Mm. They were just fucking banded in together. That's pretty rough. You're lumped in with your family as just one entity that nobody gives a shit about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're just like a number. Yeah. <laughs> That's sad. Yeah. Uh, so one morning... It was known that um, Ham, Father Ham, oh, here comes Ham, dragged Jim, Lincoln, and Charlie out of bed in the middle of the night. He took them outside in their pajamas in the middle of winter, the freezing cold snows on the ground, and the three of them had to put their thumbs on a tree stump used for chopping wood. And their father took an axe, held it over his head, and Charlie was like six at the time. He raised the axe above their heads and thumbs and said to Charlie, if he ever put his thumb into his mouth, he would chop it off. So, like, that was his way of making them a man. <laughs> <laughs> this is like his bar mitzvah. Instead of that, they do this in the middle of the night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or at the very least to get him to stop sucking his thumb. Yeah. yeah. So he put the axe over his head and slammed it into the the stump. Didn't cut their fingers off. But he said, if I ever catch you with your thumb in the mouth ever again. Was the thumb sucking that bad? Like, what, what's it really going to do? I thought that was a part of growing up. Yeah. I mean, this... This ham did not take kindly to thumb sucking. I still do it. Scared straight, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Ham was, you know, physically violent. Severe beatings were all the time. Severe verbal. Kind of the opposite of his name. I thought he would be like a real ham. Yeah. Yeah. He's like fucking doing crazy shit like this. Like the three stooges all in one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The kids were not allowed to use the indoor bathroom. They had to go outside into a barn where they would have to take... Whatever, a poop or a pee. In there you go. The f- you got it out. The yeah, those are the, the major two. I yeah, think. Yeah, the, there's a third. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go number three. Yeah. <laughs> um. So they were just like forced to go out in the middle of the winter and shit in a barn. Um, wow. I had a neighbor like that bug did, infested. That was like that. They, they were like that. They, they made their kids uh, shit and piss outside and stuff. What they the never. Hell? They never let them in the house, and they were super. Like Christian Science or something, yeah, some weird religion or something. And my parents, of course, did nothing about it because they didn't want to. They yeah. don't want to get involved. Yeah, they That's... believe in that shit until it affects them. Though my uh, my buddy's grandfather was a cop in Boston, and he got a call from a Christian Scientist couple saying, "Hey, my baby's dead." And they showed up, and they were like, "How'd your baby die?" They're like, "Oh, it was sick for a very long time." And they were like, well, why didn't you take him to the hospital? And they, they were like, oh, we're Christian scientists. We don't believe in medicine. We don't yeah. believe in you know going to the hospital. And he, mm-hmm. my buddy's grandfather was like, uh, so you're telling me 
if you were severely injured right now, you would not go to the hospital? And he goes, no, of course not. It's in God's hands. And so he beat the shit out of that guy. Holy fuck. And the guy called an ambulance to fucking take him away oh, and go to the hospital. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> So, yeah, I feel Hard like lesson. Yeah. Did, did he get fired from being a police officer? Suspended or? with pay two weeks. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's fair. Yeah. That's when you, when you could do stuff like that. that. That's like the one cop beating the shit out of someone's story. I'm like, I can get behind. Yeah. <laughs> that's one one instance of me saying, oh, things were actually OK once in the past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just in this one scenario. <laughs> You'd think, too, if you're a Christian scientist, you'd have the kids stay in the house more because they're probably going to catch a cold outside and then just let God heal the cold. Then. I think Christian science was just like the tip of the iceberg with these people. That yeah. Was like, like, yeah. You know, there was a whole thing going on there. They, they were also crazy on top of that. It was an excuse to kill <laughs> off their family. basically. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> people are just fucking nuts, dude. You yeah. just realize you, you never know, know. That's why I don't like mix with like strangers. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah. I'm like, don't I'm, talk to me. Yeah, I'm fearful of everyone that's out there for the <laughs> most part. <laughs> so outwardly, people never knew that this was happening. Like family, friends, people in the neighborhood. I mean, they kind of lived on a farm, but like well, anytime. It's rural out there, so yeah. you can't hear like uh, at two in the morning when uh, Hammy is, is chopping, yeah, yeah, right. is chopping, chopping fingers off. off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, the sound doesn't travel that far to the next uh, haystack or whatever yeah. that house. As far as everybody else in the neighborhood and like the people that knew them were concerned, they were like a model family. Very well dressed, respectable, neat, tidy. Like the kids never talked back. They were super well behaved because they were scared for their lives. <laughs> yeah. I would be I wouldn't say shit. Yeah. They want to keep their limbs. Yeah. Yeah. This <laughs> yeah. was the fifties and sixties. So like we were saying, they lived on a farm. No one could hear the screams of children. <laughs> yeah. That's how the realtor sold it to him. <laughs> You're gonna love this place. You're no one will hear the screams from your right. family. When you're terrorizing them, ooh, I like that. <laughs> What's the ooh, uh, <laughs> ham likey? <laughs> oh, Hammy wants housey. <laughs> what percentage rate can we get here? Ham needs privacy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he, Charlie always blamed himself for the way his parents treated him. As you do when you're a kid, you're mm. like, I must be the problem. I'm a piece of shit. Yep. And that's just kind of something he carried with him his whole life. When they got old enough to go to high school, when he got old enough to get to high school, the family moved to Hampton, New Hampshire, dude. New Hampshire? Which is where I would go every year for my birthday and ride the water slides. Oh, mm. and uh, Hampton Beach. Hampton Beach, dude. Play laser tag and ride the water slides Fucking that people died spot. on. Fun. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. That are now abandoned. <laughs> yeah. A lot of meth bikers up there and just overall Lots. lunatics from Lowell or something. So high school is when he kind of started coming out of his shell and stopped being so shy and tried to hide his pain by making people laugh, as yeah. comedians have been known to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really where he came out. He was known as the class wit in 1967. Not to be confused with the class clown. Yeah, that's such a main thing to have the class wit. <laughs> it's more like the, tasteful yeah. to be the like class wit. Yeah, English <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you're, you're a raconteur. Yeah. The, the class clown <laughs> is so sophomoric. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's doing the act outs. The wit is the <laughs> fucking written and spoken. Yeah, word. yeah. The wit, clown is for yeah. the plebeians. <laughs> yeah. The class wit the next day is when it hits you like, oh, that was clever. Yeah. <laughs> I get it now. Yeah. It gets you on the ride home. <laughs> In the 1967 yearbook listed him as most talkative, which is, you know, weird for him. That could be a good or bad thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's probably bad. Yeah, it sounds kind of, you Yeah, know, someone tell Ham Jr. Sarcastic. Jr. Ham Jr. Jr. Shut yapping. the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Best yapper. Yeah. yeah. It's loud. So from there, he jumped over to Rhode Island and Providence went to the Rhode Island School of Design. RISD. It's crazy because he went there at such a crazy time. He went with um, some of the original members from the Talking Heads. Yeah. David Byrne. Yeah. There was actually a point where they had a band and David Byrne um, auditioned for it and they said no. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so he, was, he was like, all right, fuck you guys. I'm moving to New York and then started the Talking Heads. So the. Oh, wait. So, so Charlie Rocket auditioned for the David Byrne band. No. David Byrne auditioned for Charlie Rocket's buddy's band, and his buddy was like, no. It's like Joey and the Rockets or B something? But he said, in fairness, um, he said no because David Byrne was too good. So he was like, I don't want this guy that's too good when we're like dragging him down. Like, get him so out of here. So he's admitting he's a piece of shit, kind of. Kind of, like, yeah. yeah. Well, he knows his limitations, probably. Yeah. yeah. And he's going to shine more if he they both go... 
yeah. right. somewhere else to do That's it. That's probably like Bill Gates. He, uh, he was going to be like a mathematician or something. But he noticed he was like in the lower percentile of all the mathematicians out there. Yeah. So he decided to go into computers because it's like, I can't compete with that shit. So, yeah, he went to Rhode Island School of Design. Um, original members of Talking Heads he was friends with. And he ended up creating a band called the Fam. A New York Ooh, band? That's a very yeah, creative a, name. <laughs> I almost the yeah, fair avant-garde. Just a random character as you can't really pronounce. <laughs> he <laughs> he created a band called the Fabulous Motels, which actually apparently in 2016 got inducted into the Rhode Island Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I didn't know Wait there a was second. one. Hang, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> There's Rhode, no way. We're supposed to believe that the smallest state yeah. has their own Hall of Fame. It's yeah. like 10 square miles. <laughs> it's Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame. Get it's the on fuck out of here. 999 Main Street, office number 100. So <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> They're like a random like suite in the back of like some industrial park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. It really is. <laughs> I'm oh, looking at a picture yeah. right now. <laughs> you got like a Google Maps or something? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a, yeah. a nice enough building. Yeah. yeah, but it looks like where like an accountant would be. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a redone mill. A tastefully redone mill yeah. that's now an insurance And office. there's a methadone clinic there too, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently during the four years he was there, the Fabulous Motels was just, they were crushing they were doing parties. They were actually going on the road and playing other colleges, making money. No oh, shit. And this was rock music, art rock. Yeah. And he played the accordion, correct? Accordion. Yeah. Hey, what? Yeah, while somebody else played like the clarinet and they had like rock guitars and oh, stuff going this at the is same a time. Wild band. Yeah. yeah. It sounds awesome. There's really not any it's recordings like new of their stuff um, that, sucks. that you can find online. Yeah, that would be very interesting to hear. They had a buddy that like um, they all studied art and like visual design and mm -hmm. all this stuff. He uh, Charles Rocket actually studied filmmaking and arts, visual arts, and they had a guy that was strictly visual arts, and he had like a laser machine. So he would come in and set up these lasers and like yeah. have all this like crazy background. It's just like a show that you would never yeah. see anywhere else. Like a dude playing rock accordion. Are you kidding me? That's awesome. People loved it. And yeah, he just crushed. And in 1972, he married the love of his life. So the year he graduated college, he married Beth. Uh, the marriage took place aboard the USS Massachusetts. Yeah, fuck yeah. In Fall River. <laughs> oh, beautiful Fall River. Yeah. As a backdrop. Romantic. Fall River sounds very <laughs> yeah. nice, but it is one of the heroin capitals of it Massachusetts. It is not very nice. <laughs> yeah. It really does sound nice. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I never even noticed that because I, I just have such a bad picture of Fall, Fall River. River. Fall yeah. <laughs> River. Yeah. How bad can a river be? Well, go take go there and find dive. out. Yeah, <laughs> fuck around and find out. Jump again. in the water's warm. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> well, they actually in um, just really quick, but in um, Martha's Vineyard, they wanted to do a um, what's it called? They wanted to do a ferry over from Fall River to Martha's Vineyard, and the people at Martha's Vineyard were like, "No, get out of here, <laughs> get out of here. We do not want those people here. Get your trash away." <laughs> yeah. They start shooting cannonballs at the ferry if it tries to cross. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they do it old school there. <laughs> yeah. So he's like married, he's going through college, has a fit what semi-famous band that he's in. It's all working out. Making money, making music, fresh off being the class wit. <laughs> <laughs> he's hot off being the class wit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. like he's the state wit now. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. He went to, in 1973, went to an Alice Cooper concert, and apparently there's a famous picture of him um, that he took with him. He's like, dude, just take a picture with me. And uh, Alice Cooper did while he was on stage, and that made it to the RISD yearbook. Apparently. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that's a pretty cool pic. So he's just like living his best life Yeah, at that point. It's crushing life. So 1973 is where everything started taking a turn. Uh -oh. The Fabulous Motels disbanded. Some of the members moved on, but Charlie stayed. So he was in Rhode Island for a while, you know, figuring out what he wanted to do. Other people went to New York or L.A., and he's just trying to find his way. Yeah. So as you do, you go immediately to Seekonk, Massachusetts. Okay. And enter yourself into a demolition derby. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, he was just like, kind of, I want to do stuff that's funny. Um, so he took a film crew to the Seekonk Speedway and got crushed and annihilated by a bunch of cars. <laughs> he, uh, 
He survived. He survived. Yeah. He got good like footage out of it. And made like a funny video. Okay. So he's just doing. He's like jackass, right? Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah, he's like doing that yeah. that type of shit. And then he was just like, you know what? If I'm gonna stay here, I gotta work. So he was six foot five, and so he worked as a bartender and a security guard at this place called Leo's. He had a buddy that was working there that was also six foot four, so they were known as the tallest bartenders in town. Which <laughs> the twin, the original twin hmm. towers. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> no, too, I, I didn't too mean. Soon. I didn't mean the nine eleven twin towers. I meant uh, David uh, Robinson in. Um, and what's his name from the Spurs? Uh, all I can think about is the Twin yeah, Towers. Yeah, okay, never Come mind. On, mind. The twin Towers. <laughs> you, all you I can't... can think about is the Ashes. <laughs> you can't say Twin Towers and I no, think of the World Trade Center. No, 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 basketball players. No, no, no. Oh. 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 You got it all wrong. It's <laughs> <laughs> like about basketball, not terrorism. <laughs> um, so Leo's is like a legendary place. It sounds like a place where people go to get shot or something. Or like an old, like one of those crazy places where gangsters hang out. And stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You never know who you're insulting in the back of the room. Like the mobbed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't want to say anything off color. You don't want to get dr- blackout drunk and say something to the wrong person. Yeah, like Joe Pesci sitting there yeah. just waiting. What the fuck did that ah, guy say? <laughs> funny how. <laughs> get your shine I'll box. You. I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite part of the Goodfellas, where there three bums are just at the corner of a bar like, you're not going to ruin my party. There's like, no, what party? Yeah. Three, you idiots. You're all <laughs> bums. <laughs> yeah, yeah, losers. <laughs> so uh, Charlie's managing this club. It's in East Providence, and on... April 1st, 1974, he gets the wild idea to be like, hey, we need to put on this fabulous motel show. Mm -hmm. So he invites the guys from New York. They take a bus down and they have this crazy party there. Uh, They put this show together and it does not go well. The owners were there to see it, to be like, oh, should this be like an in-house band or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they did not appreciate it. <laughs> Why? Well, well, I could see that energy of like a dive bar place who who have regulars that like, you know, yeah. they don't like new age, like, you know, a band coming in and like doing their shit. There's lasers, there's accordions, they're playing yeah. like the kazoo and there's a guy in a chicken suit dancing around, like all real stuff that they yeah. really did. These are like Bob Seger fans. And yeah. they're, bring, they're bringing this wild fucking whatever show there. Play night moves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Bogdanovich, not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> Play still the same. Yeah, so Bob so this is like a rave. Yeah. And they were asked to stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please stop. Everyone. They yeah. came in with all the energy, and like, it was just not reciprocated whatsoever. Ouch. Upper management did not like it. The owners did not like it. So he resigned from that position at Leo's. That's sad. <laughs> all good things yeah. come to an end. One tower yeah. has gone down. Yeah. So that oh, was Mark. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm using that analogy for. <laughs> So with the basketball thing. <laughs> and the other tower will come down eventually. Yeah. yeah. And about 45 Give minutes later. Give it a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when he left the job, he was like, fuck, what do I do now? Um, he was a good looking dude. And, you know, he was well spoken. So between 1974 and 1979. <laughs> he had a great wit, too. Yeah, he was a very <laughs> sharp tongue, if you know what I mean. He was a beautiful specimen, if you yeah. ask me. <laughs> Kyle likes him as much as he liked the John Eric Hexum. Oh, yeah, yeah, You know, yeah, that, yeah. that centerfold he had. Yummy yeah. morsel. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. I mean, Charlie Rocket was not as uh, oiled up. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> he, he wasn't as hot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when he hit the stage sometimes, maybe he was. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From 1974 to 1976, he worked as a TV news reporter for the local news channel, 12 WPRI, which has been known to this podcast because Jeff Dadarian, the owner of the Station Nightclub, also worked there. Oh, my God. That same place. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Charles Rocket, actually, he sent in a satirical audition tape that he made in film class while in college. And they were just like, yeah, you're hired. Even really? this guy, even his audition tapes are satirical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's always got some kind of clever angle on everything. Yeah. So the producer that hired him didn't know it was a bit and thought he was being serious. <laughs> oh, that so, says a lot about that. So he's doing like a parody of like a newsman. Yes. Oh, that's but, good. But this guy's just too smart for his area. Like Rhode yeah. Island, you know, nothing nothing wrong with Rhode Island. But, you know, they're, they're not really going to understand some, like, subversive, you know, ridiculous satire. That, yeah, satire like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Especially around this time. It's like 1975. You would understand now because Stephen Colbert has done, like, you know, the Colbert Report and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. As Bill O'Reilly. So he sends in, like, this 
satirical tape that's a bit. The guy doesn't get it. He's like, you're hired. You're great. And the next thing he's doing is interviewing the governor in front of the state house. <laughs> wow. The channel loved his voice, his face. Mm -hmm. He ended up immediately becoming the face of the station. They put his face on bus station stops, actual buses, billboards, everything. You couldn't go around Providence without well, seeing the, you know, Charles Rocket's face. I'm sure the guy before him looked like a, a longshoreman after a bad... <laughs> like, you know, he's not really replacing much, I'm sure. The, the, yeah. But just think of how crazy that is. The you, talent pool is is very small. Then. Yeah. You graduate college, and then boom, you're the face of a news station after, like... So lucky, yeah. <laughs> that is, yeah, I think I think that is part luck, too. Yeah. I mean, he's got a chiseled face. What do you want? Okay. Yeah, That's and... A huge getting, cock. A little carried away here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huge what? He said he you was, heard it. Yeah. <laughs> I did hear it. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the chicken. You said head, right? Yeah. And shaft. Um, okay. Hello. That room. He was hired. He was the face of the network. And then he him... probably just considered it like this is a job I'm going to do for a while. Like David Letterman yeah. did a similar job. Yeah. But he was just like, eventually, you know what? We got to get out of Rhode Island because this place is a bummer. It so is. Him and Beth <laughs> moved to. <laughs> just listen to. Uh, never mind. <laughs> he I was going to say, see the station episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that could have been him in his uh, wacky band. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Burning down <laughs> the station yeah. nightclub. With the lasers and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lasers are starting the fire. <laughs> the biggest laser uh, fire. Cutting fucking parts of the walls off. <laughs> yeah. the oh, they're real lasers. Yeah, open. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then Jack Russell is muttering to himself like, damn showboats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen to this. <laughs> Fucking accordion laser. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they think they're so great. <laughs> so they were like, screw Providence. We're getting up. We're going to Colorado Springs. What? Um, he okay, was that's not much better. Come on. He was offered a job Never at, been. at KOAA, uh, which was a NBC affiliate under his own name. And then he was there for a little bit. And then was like, let's go. We're work we're gonna move to Nashville. And he was an anchor man for WTVF. And because he had a strange like surname, uh so the whole time he was going by Charlie Clavery. Okay. Oh, he Clavery. was Clavery oh, yeah. still. Okay. okay. Yeah. But in college he was Rocket. Okay, he was Rocket in the band in yep. college. Exactly. Then went but, back to but Clavery. His student yes. ID said Clavery still. I'm yeah, sure. exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they like got gone to the DMV and changed it. Yeah. There. Too many strings would have to be pulled to get the ID. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. But because he had such a weird name in Nashville, they're like, this ain't going to work down here. Oh yeah. And so since he's from the Northeast, he was like, you know what? I'm going to be a Kennedy. Oh so, yeah, ooh. yeah. <laughs> he was Bad. Charlie Ke Charles Kennedy. Bad move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Things don't turn out so yeah, great they, with they that name. They don't like them down in the south either. Yeah, especially right. in the south. They'll uh bad record history or bad history there. Um so yes. That's it. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> he um at this time, you know, he's got all these news jobs. He's on his third one now. He's gaining a lot of industry knowledge and still in the NBC family. So he was like stable. He's got a wife. He's got a kid now. Uh, his son Zane was born. Um, there's no official date right now. Apparently, it's 76 or 77. I'm actually gonna look. That's it up what right it says on the Wikipedia. It's just a vague couple of dates. <laughs> he was That's born. That's very avant-garde to not have a birthday. Yeah, yeah. No birth certificate. Just appeared. Their son Zane was born in 1976. Okay. Oh, okay. And so in 1980, he was just like, I'm sick. Of being Charles goddamn Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I need to get back to actually being funny. That's like what my calling is. Mm -hmm. So in 1980, he was like, I'm done. I want to go back to comedy. He moved his family to New York City. And he submitted a video of his actual news reports. Actual news reports to mm -hmm. Lauren Michaels. So to get the real news job, he sent a funny video in. Yeah. And then to get the NBC big SNL job, he sends a real news report in. <laughs> well, maybe he just like they need a straight guy, like, like yeah. Uh, what's it called? Um, uh, Leslie Nielsen, you know, just right. a straight guy. You know, sometimes that that works. Yeah. So this season is the infamous replacement season, and so Lauren Michaels needs a whole new cast. They ended up giving him a chance. So what happened before that was like all of SNL 
sucked or something like you know sometimes the NBC, NBC executives will say you know no one likes this we're gonna yeah. have to redo the entire cast and everything that wasn't the case though with Charles Rocket season but that was when Dick Ebersole came in no, no that, that was, was after Charles Rocket okay yeah so Lauren was uh, looking for potential new cast members for the show but his contract demands were denied by NBC and he was like peace out fuck y'all was it a money thing too? Is it just I think it like was. control? He wanted a guaranteed amount of seasons, and they weren't giving it to him. Oh, uh, so he wanted some security, like yeah, say, exactly. like I could do this job for four more years. Because the way he's looking at it, he's like, dude, I'm bringing all this talent in. I got Chevy mm-hmm. Chase, all these people. He's like, I can go make movies and TV shows, so I'm gonna go do that. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Um, so when he left, Gene Demanian was hired. Who is that? That was the uh, associate producer. Under Lauren. Yes. Okay. So she had been with the show. Yeah. And she was also, she would book talent. She knew the most about like the, the operations and how to like, yeah. It out. yeah. Yeah. That was her main skill was she could, she was great at booking talent. Yeah. yeah. Great musical guests, great guest hosts. So it seems like the job of Lauren Michaels, there's like a big overlook of the entire operation you have to figure out and not just find good talent and stuff or you know right because she's just booking guests and stuff right it transcends that exactly yeah so she didn't have lauren's what the french call je ne sais quoi oh <laughs> when it came up to running the frenchy <laughs> running the show so he was immediately hired as the weekend update anchor but was also in a lot of sketches gene Demanian loved charles rocket she thought that Charles Rocket was the one that was going to be the breakout star. Yeah. The Neo. And she the was, um, I read this book growing up. We had hanging around the house called Saturday Night, a backstage history of Saturday Night Live. Is that Ooh. the Tom Shales one? No, it's not. It's This is written in the 80s, actually. Oh. And so it covered the early years plus this horrendous season in 1980. So one of the things that struck her about Charles Rocket is that she thought he was tall, thin, and good looking in a predatory way. Mm. Wow, that's a weird way predatory. Yeah, that and- last part was uh, <laughs> is kind of scary. He's like, "Oh, thank you. Oh, predatory? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What was the last thing you said? <laughs> like she just he screamed, <laughs> "Leading man to her." Yeah. Well, I feel like SNL has their types, and it all goes back to that original cast. Like, they have the good-looking, you know, mm. straight-delivery guy, which they, they have in Colin Joe's now, I think. And I think initially it was um, Chevy Chase. And they just, like, Norm MacDonald played that part a little bit. but Jimmy Fallon. He took it completely insane, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But, like, they have those parts. You know, they have the Belushi. They have the, the Aykroyd part. And I think they're just different variations of that. Yeah. And so she was just Team Rocket. Let's just put it that way. She had a ride All the rocket. For yeah, she, she wanted to ride Charlie that rocket. rocket. Yeah. <laughs> she was very uh, writer friendly. So, like, she was actually, like, very, she pr- prided herself. Yeah. Yeah. She prided herself in, you know, being a, a writer's uh, writer's friend. Producer, producer. Yeah, writer's yeah. producer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there were, like, a lot of problems with the writing. Like, Weekend Update was not doing well. And, she knew, like, it's not him. Now it's the writers. And so there was, like, this huge standoff with the writers versus Gene. Yeah. And there was, like, a mutiny. And so there were so many problems with this season. It's crazy with, just an off note, it's crazy with SNL how quickly the turn rate is. Like, yeah. like every yeah. single, some people do, like, a like a full year staffing. Uh, for writers, they do, like, six months. It's, like, a half season. It's so very like, weird, yeah. You're in and out. I knew uh, a, a, a teacher of mine, like, a, a sketch teacher. He got hired at SNL. I'm like, dude, you fucking made it. Congratulations. Yep. And then, like, next thing I talk to him, I'm like, I'm out. Dude, it's crazy. Yeah. I know someone who's a very good writer, um, doing very well with stand-up, is starting to get a big following. They were on for one season, and they are, like, very good friends with one of the main people that are there now. That, yeah. it, that's a mainstay. Um, I thought that was very weird, but I also know another writer who's there that in the three or four years they've been there, they have a third of a writing credit for one sketch. <laughs> so it's like, wow. I don't know what they're thinking over there. Like Maybe they have their own. It's a room dynamic. So mm-hmm. if yes. someone makes the room work, it doesn't matter if they're not getting their stuff in. Yeah. It's just you got to make sure the, 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 the wheels and the, you know, the gears are all moving and that person helps. Grease that. Yeah, it's exactly. a machine. Yeah. That's why it works. That's why 
Lauren puts together the entire machine yeah. and not just like the small parts and stuff. And to use your analogy, not everybody fits into that machine. Yeah, like, like we don't need a, your you know part right now. Right. And Larry David famously got one sketch on the entire season. He yeah. was a writer. Is that oh, the, I didn't the, even realize he was there. Yeah, in the I thought 80s. he was just Fridays. I think that was the job he quit, and then he tried to go back to exactly. He tried to like, <laughs> hey, he, yeah. he pretended Y'all miss me, he right? did. He pretended he didn't send the email. Where yeah, he quit. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Showed up on Monday. <laughs> is, is that George over there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just to set up this season, they're following the original cast. That's yeah. insane. They're the replacements. Yeah, we're, we're talking about like Dan Aykroyd and yeah. John Belushi and Gilda Radner and Jane Curtin, the OGs of SNL. This yeah. is Cam Newton coming in for Tom Brady. It absolutely <laughs> is. It ain't going to be pretty. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> These are not ready for prime time. No. For sure. <laughs> it ain't Aaron Rodgers showing up to replace five. You know no. what I'm saying? Yeah. I had to bring it to Packers because I bring it back in. Yeah. He's wearing a Packers shirt right now. Well, let's not talk about that right now. For the uh, audience. Dead in the water. So, <laughs> done. it already was starting to get bad press before it even hit the air, the new season. Yeah. Um, you said she prided herself on being good with the writers, but yeah, like you mentioned later, they hated her, <laughs> and they ended up not getting along at all. And she would write them notes that said things like, make it funnier. Yeah, stop sucking. <laughs> and she knew nothing about it. Her thing was she was great at putting on a show, like getting guests, getting talent. Yeah. yeah. And she was very visually oriented. It's not a knock. It's just a certain skill well, set. Well, it's more of like a stage play producer. Yes. And not like a TV show producer. Because I think like SNL is somewhere in between where you're doing stage acting kind of for the audience. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're also doing for, you know, a broadcast because it's live. Yeah. It's not the same thing. And Lauren understood it and she didn't. Yeah. And she also wasn't a fan of subversive dark humor. Mm -hmm. She was more a fan of broad humor. And so the writers didn't like her. So they would even in read throughs throw in words like Oedipus because she would pronounce it like Oedipus. <laughs> Well, she was not an I intellectual. I think these writers were probably assholes dumb. too. Of course, this is the time when, like you know, the Tom Kenny Harvard people were all still around. Which is yeah, like, Tom Kenny was like started the 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 lampoon and all this. No, not Tom. No, oh, no. Tom is the voice of SpongeBob. Oh my God! Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I recognized Doug, that name. Sorry, Doug Kenny. Doug, yeah, Kenny. Doug Kenny. Doug Kenny. Yeah, Tom yeah. Kenny's nice. From yeah, what I hear. <laughs> yeah, great guy. <laughs> His wife is great too. Mr. Show. And yeah, yeah, SpongeBob. Yeah. No, you're right though. They but were these assholes. Were just like yeah. dicks who thought they were like you know uh, superior. One of the writers actually wrote a memo about how bad things were going, and it got leaked to the press. And so in the New York Daily News, before the show aired, before the first episode of the season aired, they ran an article called, Is the All-New Saturday Night Live Not Even Ready for Airtime? Oh, my God. The press loves talking about SNL for some reason. Like, oh, even, even today. Before a scene's even released, yeah. one sketch is so, like they're talking shit. And so now we get to the premiere date, which was November 15th, and the host is Elliot Gould. Oh, God. And so the Speaking first sketch, yeah. the first sketch is a threesome. And the first sketch, if you'll remember, <laughs> uh, it's that infamous uh, <laughs> Bob Carroll, Ted, and Alice. Oh, the sucking and fucking. Yes, the the the, the fuck fest uh, movie. It's a fuck fest. Yeah. yeah, from uh, the 1960s with Natalie Wood. Yeah. So yeah, let's parody a movie from like ten years earlier. <laughs> Makes no sense. Yeah. So that's the setup of this first sketch. Yeah, it's a parody of a specific scene in the movie too, where they're all in bed together. Yeah. So the sketch starts with Elliot Gould in bed with the cast members. Okay. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> Mr. Gould. Oh, oh, hi. Uh... Gail. Gail Matthias. I don't think we better get ready. It's almost time for the show. Oh, God. Oh, Wait. relax. What are they going to do? Start without us? <sighs> You're going to be just fine on this show. There he is. Sort of a cross between Gilda and Jane. <laughs> oh, hi, Charlie. <laughs> don't. Oh, don't. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's just great. <laughs> Let's see, you're you're the one. Go oh, kind of a cross between Chevy Chase and Bill Murray. Okay. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Yeah. And that's how everyone like knew him back in the day. It was like, oh, he's the Chevy Chase mixed with Bill Murray. And it's like they 
planted that seed in people's brains. Yeah. They fucking said it. Yeah, and it's so literally stupid. in the first yeah. sketch of the season. They're in the way, first 30 seconds of the season. They're way over the heads of America. It's like, no one's even thinking that or cares. They just yeah. want to see a funny fucking show. They don't care about this meta inside baseball bullshit that they're trying to pull yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. Fuck you, writers of the I 70s at SNL, you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> and the, Tell them, Mark. The reaction um, was not good, obviously. The Associated Press wrote, the new Saturday Night Live is essentially crude, sophomoric, and most of all self consciously cool and then newsday wrote quote saturday night live dead on arrival and oh quote. my god get a fucking life why are you writing about snl that much it's back crazy. when anyone cared i know and then the last note about this launching period is charles rocket never had anxiety about replacing the cast and always had confidence yeah he was just doing his thing i think that's the mindset you have to have in that position you know you're doomed to fail you just have to have fun and not ruin your career afterwards which is you know yeah i don't know it's tough to do i guess it is yeah yeah so he had like good parts of the season though like the rocket reports there were many of them that were funny yeah um and that was objectively said yes everyone basically said the rocket report and he was just good. doing basic man on the street man on the street stuff like billy eichner does now and stuff. yeah like, yeah yeah. That's a good comparison. Yeah. And he's doing it so much earlier, and he never gets credit for that. Right. And not not to reference jaywalking, but that's the worst <laughs> oh. version. Hey, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> Howard Stern always fought with Leno about who invented jaywalking. Oh, yeah. that's a he big... thought he stole it from Howard. Howard thinks everyone I stole know. everything from him, but that's the whole... We can go Yeah, we'll, on, we'll on get into that another yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> and Jay Leno would be like, no, no, Steve Allen did it. I'm just doing <laughs> Steve Allen. Exactly. <laughs> And now, the Rocket Report. Hi, Charles Rocket on Fifth Avenue. We're going to meet some people that are total strangers. Let's find out what they're like. Will they be rude? Will they be warm? Will they be friendly? Will they be happy to see us? Well, we're going to find out in just a minute or two as we actually go ahead and meet some total strangers. Hey, you're on drugs right now, aren't you? You're on drugs right now. You look like a drug taker. I mean, typically. Don't take drugs? No. Never have? No. Well, gee, what gives you that look, that sort of drug taker's look? Well, because I'm very happy. That must be it. Well, happy to meet you, Charles Rocket. Your name? Bill Gunshman. Bill, nice meeting you. Okay, Bill. Um, so Charles had some success in this season, but it was all overshadowed by Charles's use of what Alejandro called the fuck word. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Before we started recording, I told Kyle, like, oh, I, I put the clip, you know, in the drive where Rocket says the fuck word. <laughs> I'm, Whoa. I meant to say the F word. Yeah. I fainted after. <laughs> you say the fuck word? Oh, my Lord. So there's uh, a number of accounts about this. Um, they they were doing like a Who Shot JR parody. Nice. And of the show Dallas. Yes. I mean, even that was like a reference that was too late, wasn't it? No, it was popular at that time. It was? Yes. And Charlene Tilton was on Dallas and she was the host of this episode. Got you. Okay. So they just did, you know, callback or references. A standard. Whoever's there. Who yeah. shot JR parody. The Simpsons later did a yep. similar parody with Who Shot Mr. Burns. Yep. Oh, right. Yeah. And in the episode, actually, you know who the musical guest was? Prince. No oh, wow. Shit. Isn't that interesting? He Justin wasn't the Guarini. Weird, he wasn't the weird symbol or anything? <laughs> no, he was uh Not yet. He that was, was 90s. Young Prince. He wasn't here. showing his ass cheeks yet. This is <laughs> Prince that wants to like get famous, but he's not famous yet. <laughs> yeah. No, this was Prince like right on the brink. This is a yeah. few years before. So Purple Prince got Rain. way too famous way too quick, and then he's like, fuck you people. <laughs> yeah. And ironically, in his that. in his musical number, the producers swear he said fucking <laughs> he in, probably during did. a musical performance probably. in the same episode. That's hilarious. And so the idea was that the um, the cast members had some reason for wanting to kill Charles Rocket. And so then near the end of the show, there's some unidentified person that shoots him. And then after that, during the good nights is when Charles Rocket is out there improvising. Uh, yeah, so he... We'll play the clip first. This is Charles Rocket saying fuck on live TV. The fuck word, if you will. <laughs> Charlie, how are you feeling after you've been shot? Oh, man, it's the first time I've ever been shot in my life. I'd like to know who the fuck did it. 
everyone's like, ooh. ooh. That was like crazy back then. So tame. It's so tame. But it is not illegal to say fuck on, on primetime television. There's some agreement, I think, that you, you don't say it on the major networks or something. But I don't think there's ever there's not a, uh, a rule yeah. that says you cannot. So there's one of the writers that was on the show ended up coming out and said, uh, of course he did it on purpose. He planned it. Yeah, I bet. Because he wanted to mess with the show. And so there's like debate about whether he said it in the, the warm-up show. Um, Because SNL does a run through before everything. Yeah. But regardless, he said it on TV, and that's the reason why he was fired. Yeah. This is a show that was on the decline all season long, starting from that Elliot Gould episode. So maybe yeah. Charles Rocket's theory is that this will reinvigorate the the series or SNL in general if he starts saying fuck. Could be. It could just like get. I think he was also just frustrated with the entire experience. Really? Yeah. Yes. So he wanted to get them some fines or something. And he just wanted to, you know, go out in style. Maybe, maybe yeah. he's like, "They're gonna fire me. This is a weird thing I'm in the middle of here. Fuck them." And what Literally. led to this moment is ad sales were dropping, ratings were low, and yeah. overall morale was horrible. Yeah, because obviously, if the writers are all pissed off, it's gonna be a weird show because no one's really happy. Yeah. So it resulted in just a very uneven season of pretty stupid sketches and just lame material. And so we have some examples of that. Yeah. What's considered to be the worst episode of the season is the one that Malcolm McDowell hosted, the guy from A Clockwork Orange. Yeah. And then the worst sketch in that episode is considered to be Leather Weather. Would you like to hear some of it? Oh, I can't wait. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to the Leather Report. Leather Weather Report. I'm your Leather Weather girl, <laughs> Thelma Thunder. And this is our weather map. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Shut up. Maps are to be seen, not heard. There's not really, there's there's not really much else to this. You've just the seen Midwest the entire payoff of the joke. Week. And now they just continue to do it for like five uh, more minutes. Yeah, he's wearing a God's gimp mask well, chained to the wall on me? a weather map. Yeah, so and then she's <laughs> like, and we got some storms here. And then she starts whipping them. Yeah. yeah. So that was leather weather. And then... Here's a clip of him on Weekend Update. So let me welcome the couple who have kept such a low profile for the last six years with a big hearty hello to Mr. and Mrs. John Lennon. Hi. <laughs> hello, hello Charles. <laughs> Say, what's that you're drinking, John? It's a natural Coke I'll make with just a touch of cinnamon. Malcolm McDowell it's and John good. Lennon. Classic. Yoko is just loco about my Coco. <laughs> So stupid. Killer okay, riding. So there you go. Killer. And <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine now Frank and like, I came up with the most brilliant line ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think he might have been off the show at that oh, point. Oh, was he? Yeah. 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 They had whole new writers and cast staff. Yeah. If you listen to Gilbert on Joe Rogan, he talks about his experience during this season. Gilbert Gottfried was one of the cast members. Yep. And he said that the writers also didn't like him. So in one sketch, they wrote him as the corpse <laughs> in a coffin. He just had to sit in a, in a coffin. I'm telling yeah. you, these people, they think they're you know untouchable. And uh, they're Harvard grads. So off the bat... They think the cast are just like stupid people who they could boss around because they need the job. Yeah. And then they're like Harvard guys. They're basically bulletproof. And, you know, they, you know, I, I think that dynamic just fucking sucks. Yeah. Yeah. There's also word on the street that, you know, Eddie Murphy was on this season too. He got brought in late, right? Yeah. And he was a featured player. Yes. 19 years old. Yeah, and so Eddie started taking a lot of the shine as a featured player, and Charles was supposed to be like the guy. So yeah. there was... Apparently some tension there where he was just like, you know, this fucking guy's taking my spot. And just to bring up the writers again, I heard a lot of them would not work with Eddie Murphy or did not work with him. They just wouldn't write for him. Oh, wow. Like they, they didn't really include him in a lot of sketches, whereas, you know, he was kind of the superstar even when yeah. he came. Who's they, widely known as like one of the most prolific stand up comedians and comedic performers of ever. Yeah. <laughs> I know. At that time, I'm not writing though, for him. But not at that time. Well, yeah, he's a 19 year old no, well, kid then. Yeah. yeah. No, but, but still, it was his. Uh, Star power though was pretty evident was coming right through. away. Yeah. 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 So my theory is that SNL and th this probably isn't even a good theory because it was, you know, early eighties. 
Yeah, it was 1980. Yeah, so. 1980, 81. Charles Rocket said the N-word in a sketch. Wait, 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 what? Early in the season, and that was not a big deal, but him saying fuck in the season finale got him fired. So I think that SNL was kind of like, maybe we got to get away from this N-word thing, but also maybe not. Maybe mm. the tipping point was really the F word. Because at this time, they're not really that concerned about them now, but like fundamentalist Christians really were an issue. You know, yeah. that, that was the biggest issue like years ago for doing salacious stuff on TV. Right. But, Charles but the N word, they're, you know, that, that group of people, they're <laughs> fine with that. The N word that he says in the sketch is in the sketch, though. Yeah. It's not something he just throws in. So, like, that was the written word. But I think Mark is right on this one. You're just proving another point and entirely. You're wrong. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, you're also proving the same point. That was written. So yeah. that's not on Child's Rock. It's no, these not asshole at all. writers yeah. who we've talked about but, are yeah, assholes. But you're right that him saying the F word was the tipping point. That was the straw that broke this camel's back. The N word's back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so Whoa. let's. Okay. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's hear the. This is a sketch Catch. called Kami Hunting Season, and this is on YouTube under Saturday Night Live, who also wouldn't <laughs> hire Shane Gillis for using a racial slur. It sure is exciting, Uncle Lester. My very first commie hunt. Well, hell, Jim Bob is the first one they've allowed now in 20 years. I expect I'm ever bit as jacked up as you are. <laughs> are they easy to spot, Uncle Lester? Well, sometimes they is and sometimes they ain't. So funny. If they's already. demonstrating like commies tend to do, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Well, well, what if they ain't demonstrating? Well, hell, Jim Bob, all you got to do is just shoot yourself a Jew or a Whoa. Chances are better than even you'll be shooting a commie, anywho. Jeez. Okay. Wait, nice. Piscopo kind of freezes there. Oh, Piscopo's right, like, eh. <laughs> wow. I don't know Joe wow. Piscopo or what his politics are, but that's, you know, that's a lot to take in right there. It is. Like, wow, he's living Johnny dangerously, if you know <laughs> what I mean. And they didn't nice. get along at all, Charles Rocket and Piscopo. Oh, I really? I can imagine. Yeah, and in fact, at one time they were yelling at each other in the writer's room, <laughs> and Piscopo yells, you're one-dimensional. And then Charles Rocket stood up and said, you say that, Joe, and I'll rip your throat out. Well, you already said it. Oof. Well, that's foreshadowing. Yeah. I thought I thought you'd like that little foreshadowing. <laughs> Yeesh. Joe Piscopo, <laughs> I don't know. what What is up with that guy? <laughs> we, we don't have time to get into <laughs> yeah. Joe, Joe Piscopo. Uh, just to wrap up that season, you posed... Uh, I posed a half-hearted theory that I don't fully believe in, but they were trying to get away from the N-word being on TV okay. by, and uh, they're like, eh, we're firing this guy for saying the F-word. But you also posed that Charles Rocket said it on purpose. The N-word? No, the F-word. Oh, the F-word. The F-word, yeah. Yeah. Word. yeah. Uh, yeah, people from the show have said that, that he planned okay. on it to fuck But with it was him. also from one of the writers who we've deemed- That's also true. The kind of, you know, bad people. In so the according to the SNL book, though, a few minutes later in the dressing room, Charles Rocket felt very guilty about it, and he was mad that he created another problem for Jean Domanian. And she came in saying, like, did you really say that? And he was like- you know, I, I don't even remember, you know, and I didn't mean to. And so that's what he maintained mm. is that he didn't say it. On purpose. I don't know what's what here. It's like everything is just upside down. I have no clue what's real. And that ended the season. Basically, it was already a train that was off the tracks. And so Bill Murray was already scheduled to host the next week. Yeah. And that would become the final episode with that cast for so that season. So they just decided, or they cut it short, or does it they just... cut it short? But Bill Murray already happened to be booked, so they all got one more episode, and yeah. we have a clip of that. So what? What if the show gets canceled? You guys never oh, get to do on. movies or anything like that. Don't say that. Oh, well, that's good. I mean, you know, Charlie, you're very funny. I love those rocket reports. Do you really mean that, Bill? People are telling me you're imitating me, Charlie, though. I don't like to hear that. <laughs> and uh, watch your mouth. Clean it up. <laughs> Who are you? What's your... I, I, I'm Gilbert. Gilbert. Gilbert, cheer up for me, will you, pal? Huh? Wait, is that that's <laughs> after the F word? Yeah, yeah, this was a week later. Yeah. Oh, and that sure. ended up being their final episode. The only... Well, that Monday, Dick Ebersol was brought in to replace Gene Domanian. And the only cast members that survived were Eddie Murphy and Joe Piscopo. Wow. Yeah. Imagine that. They're like, we want to keep Joe Piscopo. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they decided. I know. And you get out of here. 
Oh, and so that was it. And at the final staff meeting, Charles Rocket bought a bottle of champagne to celebrate Gene Domanian's reign on the show. And some people thought that was a little odd. Yeah. Seeing yeah. as she was fired and they were all <laughs> getting fired. And then after that, there was one final blowout party thrown at this Japanese restaurant. And Bill Murray showed up. Al Franken and Tom Davis showed up. The whole cast and crew were there. Yeah. And the song Celebration came on for in the book, they said, about the hundredth time. So they kept dancing to the song Celebration. They just played it on repeat. Yeah, yeah. even though they're all fired and it's that kind of a bad time. like insanity. Wow. Yeah, there's what, a lot going on. What a wild, but it sounds like it's exciting though. I'm sure. In, yeah, in that moment, you're like, you know, I got fired, but you know, you know. Whatever. In some ways, it fits into his avant-garde persona. Yeah, yeah. like I'm a performance artist. I, I guess, created something interesting. Sue me. This is the only thing we're talking about this season. Exactly. Like, are you kidding yeah. me? Uh, he said, "There's nothing worse than being in the middle of a sketch while you're in 40 million living rooms and having it bomb." Oh, that sounds awful. Yeah, it's live. Yeah. And you're just like you're you're the only thing on that fucking television network at that time. Yeah. And everyone could see how horrible you're doing. And yeah. even though he always <laughs> maintained his self confidence, that must have been just a crushing blow to go in thinking you're gonna be the next Chevy Chase. Yeah. And yeah. then leave being totally and not destroyed on your, on by your the own. press. Yeah. 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 Because Chevy Chase left on his own. He's like, fuck this, I'm out of here. And I, I think he fucked over some of the people. They were pretty pissed off that he left so early because they didn't establish the show really the way they needed to. But he just like, fuck it. I got one. I got, you know, Fletch or whatever movie. Yeah. He's like, I'm out of here. And like, I think <laughs> that like uh, Belushi and like Bill Murray and them, they were like pissed off. Oh, I'm sure. Because not many people realize he was on one season. Yeah, one That's season. Crazy. One season. The first season. What a only. career after that. That's unbelievable. He he's came known back, as a SNL guy. He came yeah. back to, to guest season. host. And I guess that's when uh, him and uh, Bill Murray got in the fist fight. I guess Belushi instigated the entire thing. <laughs> but because he, he was more mad. He called you a pussy. Because he wasn't as successful as yeah. Chevy Chase, I think. Right. That, it, like Deep down, that's really what it was about. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so he gets fired. The whole show pretty much gets chopped. They get another season. And then I, I think Lauren Michaels comes back the next season. No, he came what? back in 1985. Oh wow! That's yeah, a long Dick Ebersol ran it for several years. Well, he wrote wow. uh, the Three Amigos. He wrote that movie. That's right. Yeah, he went to movies. Yeah, and, and TV he produced and that. And yeah. he kind of saw that way through. And I'm sure a lot of other projects. Yeah, he's like I'm just going to be a filmmaker now. And you're just like, it's not the same excitement as SNL, like a week by week kind of thing. No. Movies are just a long fucking slog. Yeah. yeah, like now he's produced a million things. He's like a billionaire. At that time, though, he wasn't having that great a success until maybe the Three Amigos. Yeah. So why not go back to something he knows how to do? And yeah. he went back to SNL and returned it to its glory, even though Eddie Murphy broke out in the Dick Abersall years and, he, and like, carried saved the it. show. Yeah. Well, that's why Eddie Murphy thought he was owed a debt by Lauren Michaels and all of SNL. Cause I remember one time David Spade uh, did um, after uh, Eddie Murphy got caught with the um, transvestite mm -hmm. um, <laughs> saying he was just given a ride. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, David Spade put up a picture of Eddie Murphy and just said, Oh look, it's a falling star. And then Eddie Murphy was pissed. Yeah. Wow. He called in and he's like, I want to <laughs> talk to fucking this David Spade guy. And Charles Rocket was probably like, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, yeah, that was because Vampire in Brooklyn flopped. Oh, oh, really? oh, yes. oh, I thought it was because of the trend. No, no, it was before Nutty Professor. He makes some bad movies He sometimes. didn't have a hit for a while before Nutty Professor. Yeah. yeah. So it was a low blow, he thought. Yeah, he makes wow. some. He goes on some. He'll just go on like five movies straight, just terrible. Like any <laughs> yeah. other, any other non uh, person that wasn't as talented as him would never get away with that. No, but yeah, he gave his David Spade hardcore. So yeah, so pretty much for the entire decade of the eighties, Charles Rocket was just wandering around New York City, playing L literally wandering around, <laughs> playing music, uh, not getting paid for it, not doing well. Um, he was completely blacklisted, he felt, from the TV and film industry and didn't do anything until the 90s. Um, 1989, he filmed Dances with Wolves, which won several Oscars. Well, he was the wolf? He was the wolf, yeah. <laughs> well, the late 80s, he started to come around yeah. to TV. He was in Moonlighting mm -hmm. and Max Headroom. Yes. And a couple of movies like Earth Girls Are Easy. 
But Max had it from the TV show. Yeah. Yeah. I think he probably is like, all right, I'm going to throw all this art stuff out the window. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just going to be a, you know, a procedural television guy. Yeah. That's how I can make money. Well, once he started getting roles again, yeah, that's pretty much because for that seven, eight years after being fired S- from SNL, mm-hmm. he literally went to being the artist again and just playing his accordion. Most notably, he was on a tribute album to the composer Nino Rota, yep. who did the Fellini films. So this stuff doesn't pay very well until no. he found out the hard way. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I, I have a kid. I have a wife I need to live in. So I'm going to start doing these bullshit TV shows. Um, yeah. So Dances with Wolves, 89. He uh, was in Quantum Leap, which is it making a comeback. Yeah, it's coming back. Yeah, we mentioned that uh, last episode. Yeah. <laughs> he played a Scrooge-like character called Michael G. Blake in a Quantum Leap episode called A Little Miracle. Hmm. In this episode, he portrayed uh, many emotions and expressions. Okay. That's, so he, he that's acted. Up note. Yeah, he acted. <laughs> He's an actor. <laughs> <laughs> you got to act. You got to take the role, you know. So what starts now in the 90s is like he starts working again, but... There are a number of roles that pop up that people feel contributed to his death. Ooh. Um, really? Quantum Leap being one of them because there was a reference to his SNL days. In the episode, someone says, good evening, hear now the news, which is exactly what he would say mm-hmm. on Weekend Update. So like, it was kind of just like a, uh, yeah. just a knife in his side. The writer is fucking him again here? Yeah. Those fucking writers. <laughs> yeah. Can't trust them. You know, we're just hearing his side. So I don't know. Maybe he was a dick to the writers, too. Maybe we don't know. He Maybe he fucked them over, and they were just kind of getting back at him and stuff. It's not necessarily his side, because the stuff I said was all from that book yeah, I guess. that was written yeah. by other people. And what we're discussing is actually kind of like a, a blind item that is believed to be written by Doug Kenny? Really? Yeah. Wait, the one... He's not the one that jumped off the cliff, is he? He is the one that jumped yes. off the cliff. It yeah. wouldn't have been him then, right? But it was Oh, someone... no, the person who wrote the the book to the movie about Doug Kenny. <laughs> that sounds like a confusing... Yeah, I, I'm trying to wrap my head yeah. around that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, futile and stupid gesture. Yeah. There was a Netflix series in which they acted out the beginnings of the, the Harvard Lampoon and turn it into the National Lampoon, which, tur- you know, helped contribute to SNL. Josh Carp is... Okay. So a lot of this information is insider information believed to be written by Josh Carp. Okay. okay. Who's a staff writer for SNL during the time that Charles Rocket was there? It's possible. Okay. But I'm sure there's overlapping. He, and they, they, they People hear other. stories. Like, people... They were it, friends. In these uh, writers' rooms, they, they're so bored throughout the day that they have to like just talk bullshit all day. So yeah. I'm sure that com- stuff like gossip comes up like that. Yeah. Um, Quantum Leap. Yeah, Quantum Leap. Yeah, they ha- have that kind of homage to him probably that didn't go over well in his head. Or at yeah. least sat there like, fuck you guys. Like, you're going to bring my own shit into this. I have a theory then, too. You know how I said he was very confident during the entire SNL debacle? I think that over time, as you get older, that confidence just kind of wanes. Yeah, totally. And so by the 90s, that confidence turned into self-hatred for doing that. Yeah. That's a good theory. Yeah. Probably he just looks back and like you're like, wow, I really fucked that up. Whereas, you know, when you're a kid with like a, a, a fire in your belly, you're just like, I can do anything and doesn't matter. Oh my god, it's totally different. You know, I'm a six five white man in uh, America right now in the seventies. Like nothing can go wrong. And then you're just like looking back at how maybe you really fucked everything up. Yeah, like when you're in your twenties, <laughs> you knock over a glass. It's like, oh, it's funny. Yeah. You know, when you're older, you're senile all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so after Quantum Leap, he goes in and does Hocus Pocus. He does, which you were disappointed by. Yeah, he was like barely in it. Yeah, but th- does I thought it, it was going to be a more prominent role. What do you think he's going to play, the fucking witch? I saw Hocus Pocus for the first time <laughs> this year. Me too. Because I boycotted it forever because my sister was taken out by my aunt and my mom and like a bunch of people, and there was a girls' night, and they went and saw Hocus Pocus, which I wanted to see in 1993. But it's kind of a I could I, I could see why it's considered kind of a chick flick. Maybe they didn't want you to chick flick. 
Yeah. No, I was just like Fuck. I fucking saw it Fuck in the this theater movie forever. in yeah, 1993. Lucky. What did you have a family that cared about you? <laughs> no, I I don't want to depress you guys, but I think I was by myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, because my brother and sister and their friends went to see Free Willy, which was next door. Oh, okay. And I wanted to see Hocus Pocus. I also that's think, early for your first but I, solo movie. But I also yeah. I also think they didn't want me to be in their group either. So yeah, because I was like the young one. You know? You know? Yeah, how old were you just going this movie alone? 1993, I would like seven. <laughs> That's so funny. You just walking in there, just choosing maybe, your own seat. Maybe eight. Big, big bucket of popcorn, just <laughs> bigger than you. Hey, I had a good time. So, child, so you thought he was part was a little small. Yes. Okay. Too so, uh, small for his talent. Well, he's got to work, but you know wh- what does he think he is at this time? You know, he's not Eddie Murphy. He he didn't pan out like that. I think no. in his head, he like. It really comes to to focus how not Eddie Murphy you are when you're getting these roles and you're on the set yeah. every day. No one knows your name. You're like 30th on the call sheet. No yeah. one really cares whether or not you're doing well. No one right. checks in on you. So it's just like yeah. you're on SNL. You're pampered. You know, they take care of you every moment of the day. And, you know, I think that's what a lot of these actors like. You know, that's why they stick around for so long. Yeah. They like, you know, the treatment that they get on a set. And they just love that kind of feeling that they're catered to at, at every moment. Meanwhile, though, he actually has an acting career that most actors would envy at this well, point. Well, 95% of the actors out there would be like, holy shit, you got to be in Hocus Pocus? Holy shit, you got to be in Dumb and Dumber? Yeah. Holy shit, you got to be on SNL? Like, But he doesn't think of it like that. Yeah, it's an interesting turn after Hocus Pocus. He, um, <laughs> he goes straight into 1994 and actually repairs his relationship seemingly with SNL. Not that he needed to because there's no one there anymore and Lorne Michaels wasn't there when the whole debacle happened. He gets cast as the villain in It's Pat. <laughs> a Julia Sweeney vehicle. What a way to, to, <laughs> to come back into the SNL sphere. Yeah. And tell us, who was this Pat character on SNL? Uh, an androgynous, possibly gender fluid. The whole thing was... Is it a guy or is it a girl? Right. And so that's what Charlie Rocket They bring was... him in for the worst <laughs> elements of SNL, anything related, saying the N-word. And they, the like, whole... Bring in Rocket. We're going to do, we're going to mock trans people. Let's the bring in whole, Joe. The whole movie, he's trying to figure out if it's a guy or a girl. So he's Pat's neighbor in yeah. the movie. And he's obsessed with Pat, wondering if he's a guy or a girl. What that's the you? premise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and his uh, name well, is. Well, that was the premise of the sketch. It was like everyone's just trying to figure out if they have a dick or a vagina. And it's like. Okay, we get it after the, <laughs> the first one. And his name is Kyle. Oh, shit name. Yeah. Truth. Yeah. Kyle Ploof. Truth. Ploof. Truth. Can this guy catch a break? Nope. We got a clip of uh, Charles Rocket walking in on Pat. Ding dong. Am I interrupting anything? Oh, uh, no, just keeping a record of my innermost thoughts and feelings right here in my laptop diary. <laughs> really? What kind of stuff do you put in here? Oh, just anything anyone could conceivably want to know about me. Wow, I know people who are kids. It's all in wingdings. No way, Jose, <laughs> this is raw, uncensored, and completely personal data. Do tell. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a banana in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> no, it's a banana. <laughs> Get your own. This is my snack. <laughs> fine, fine. I can't oh, believe they made this movie. Great news. <laughs> also in 1994, Dumb and Dumber. Oh, wow. The yeah. villain there that holds him up. Uh, One of my favorite movies ever. By gunpoint at the me end. Me and my friends would just watch that over and over with Kingpin. All the Farrelly Brothers movie, basically. Farrelly. Farrelly. I, I always pronounce her name. For really? Right. Yeah, for That's really. quite a difference, isn't it? To start off the year doing It's Pat. Yeah. And then you do Dumb and Dumber. Like a comedy no one saw. Yeah. And then a comedy that today is still a Cultural juggernaut. And phenomenon. Made, it made careers. It made, oh, yeah. Kind of yeah. made uh, Jim Carrey, but I the one he did before that, which was The the, uh, the Mask. The Mask. The Mask, yeah. yeah that, that, yep. that really, you could make the argument that really made him, but I think it helped solidify him. Yeah. There were three movies that year. He Ace, Ace Ventura. Ventura the Mask and Dumb and Dumber yeah. all in one year. Uh-huh. How? Yeah. How does that happen? It's insane. <laughs> I, w- I would argue Dumb and Dumber is the funniest one. Yes. Yeah. And Charles Rocket doesn't even play a real funny part in it. No. He's the straight man. He's the straight man. The yeah. villain. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm like, this guy plays like a kind of evil bad villain. I'm like, I, I, I couldn't see him being a comedic actor, but then I found out later that that all this stuff about him, like he was a comedian allegedly. Right. Well, you need those characters for these movies to work in order to make Jim Carrey shine, as we'll find out in this clip. Yeah, that's true. Hello. Excuse me, gunman. Who are you? Oh, don't play dumb with me, asshole. I'm the rightful owner of that briefcase that you've been carrying around. Oh, well. Nicholas, my family trusted you. Shut up! Listen, Mr. Samsonite, about the briefcase, my friend Harry and I have every intention of fully reimbursing you. You open it up. Open it up! Go ahead. Open it up. Do what he says. Hurry. What is this? Where's all the money? That's as good as money, sir. Those are IOUs. <laughs> Go ahead and add it up. Every cent's accounted for. Look. See this? That's a car. 275 thou. Might want to hang on to that one. <laughs> <laughs> You're a dead man. You're a dead man! <laughs> That's you so know what good. I mean? Like you, you don't notice him hardly, even when in the scene. In the sense of Jim Carrey, it's Jim Carrey's show. Well, yeah, right. you, you don't really. He's just like a, a bit part player, kind of in in that scenario. But he's doing well. Yeah, you obviously, need but him he must have that. hated Jim. Not not hated Jim Carrey overall. Like Tommy Lee Jones hated Jim Carrey, <laughs> in which right. he said, "I I can't uh, I can't sit for your buffoonery anymore." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the set meanwhile, of uh, Batman. Yeah, meanwhile he's playing Two Face. Yeah, he <laughs> his, his, his act his acting's so over the top in that he's wild. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. I can't sanction ah, your you buffoonery. Yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, he's yeah. playing a clown in a Joel Schumacher flick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it looks ridiculous. Um. But yeah, he must have been jealous on some level of J- of Jim Perhaps. Carrey. Like, and but he is nailing the parts he's getting. That's true, and he's doing well. I don't know. Like, obviously, no one knows what's in his mind at this time. But yeah, he did pretty well in that. I just yeah, I don't know why he didn't get those big comedic roles again. And the film student in me was just watching that scene, noticing what an imposing figure he is in it. He's way bigger than them. Yeah. 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 With a tiny gun. Yeah, and just, <laughs> exactly. And he's dressed in this colorful suit. Yeah. Everything screams cartoon about right. it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, after that, he goes to murder at 1600, a Wesley Snipes uh, joint. And Dennis Miller in it. Hey, babe. It's <laughs> hey, been babe. a murder, babe. Yeah. So then he goes into this role, which is a bit part, but it's 14 hour days filming a part that lasted 90 seconds in the movie. Um, the scene is him in the middle of a street with a gun to his head, crying and snotting all over the place, snotting. saying he's going to blow his head off. Wow. Um, Wait, what are you talking? What? Murder at sixteen hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he was like the the villain or assassin or yeah. a bad person. He was yeah. just not even. Yeah, he was like a guy barely in it that was gonna blow his head off, and they end up shooting and killing him, or at least shooting him, and then they apprehend him. Yeah. So is his major complaint that he was there too long on set or something? Or no, it was you just get like, paid for this stuff. You know? It's another thing that you know could have contributed to his. Mental state. Okay. So yeah. should we be worried about anybody that's appeared in a Lars von Trier movie? Yeah, we like, should be worried about all of them. How's Nicole Kidman doing, you we, know? We should be worried about Lars von Trier. Yeah, he's an alcoholic. He's a maniac. To take Mark's point, isn't he acting? He is. But, you know, sometimes art imitates life. Life imitates art. Um, and so after this, he's in his 50s and he started growing a beard. Okay. Which the people who knew him was like kind of weird. Leading man face, and now he's covering it up. Maybe he's depressed. So for some reason at this time, everything's like kind of drying up. He does uh, an episode of Touched by an Angel. And then in 2002, Charlie was in a film called Bleach. Uh, He played Reverend Jim with a beard. So a priest with a beard. Not very common. Jesus is the one that had the beard, right? Yeah, exactly. Beard guy. It was directed by Jacob Rosenberg and was about making sins disappear by using bleach powder as a drug to remove them. Oh my God. This is a TV show? Uh, a that was a movie. Oh, okay. It sounds uh, interesting. That sounds yeah. like a Lars von Trier movie. <laughs> 
Um, so after this, he's like, fuck it. I'm going to go buy an estate in Canterbury, Connecticut. And normally that's the sign of like, we did it. Now we're just going to like live our life. Yeah. Which they thought was kind of going to be the case, but was not. Rural area, yeah. off the grid. It's never a good idea. He's kind of going back to his childhood. It's a farm estate. So they can't hear the screams of anyone. They're his screams this time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Solo, alone. Oh, no one can hear me scream? Great. Right. <laughs> I assume Ham has expired by now. Yeah, uh, Mr. Ham yeah, is ha- No pun intended. Ham Sr. That ham's been cooked. <laughs> nice. You know what I mean? I heard that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's dead. Okay. At this point. So is he still working around this time? Like after... Like, is he just getting sadder and sadder every time he does a project? <laughs> yes. They heated up for a second, and then it really cooled off. And a year after he bought the house, he was on Law & Order. But it was also um, a role that people believed, you know, didn't do well for him mentally. Yeah. Okay, so I watched it today, and it's disturbing. Wow. So it's based on, you know how Law & Order always, you know, bases it on the truth, kind of? Yeah. So it's based on Brian Wells. That guy that had a bomb collar around that. his yeah, neck yeah. and he was forced to rob a bank. Yeah. And so the episode is loosely based on that. Charles Rocket is this guy that is going around planning robberies like that. It's very complicated. Didn't you say, Kyle, like on the set, like someone like, you know, he was realizing he wasn't getting he wasn't a known entity. People were like, who is this guy? He said to people on set, do people even know who I am? Yeah. What I noticed throughout the episode is actually there's a lot of really demeaning things in it. Like Vincent D'Onofrio is like, what are you, like 55 now? Not much going on. Like, you're too oh old my to, God. you know, That's gotta hurt. to be doing this kind of stuff. And there's a lot of age put downs. Yeah. And there's a lot of suicide talk. Oof. So the whole premise turns out to be that Charles Rocket has cancer and so he's suicidal and he wants to kill people along with himself. Wow. And here's at the end where they confront him and they find pills in his pocket that they think he's trying to kill himself with. Ah. Uh. Those are Mentos. It's a trick, Margie. I, I didn't take those. You see? Oh, when we were all just sitting here. You see what he was thinking about? I'm not crazy and I'm not suicidal. Well, he's dying. And all he wants to do is to kill. To be killed. Kill himself. Oh my God, what have I done? Donnie, you really were going to shut up. You really were going to kill us both. You were going to kill me. Shut up. You have no idea what it's going to be like for me, do you? I don't deserve this. Some good acting. There you go. But that was his last on screen appearance. Why? He, what happened? On October 7th, 2005, something bad happened. Uh oh. Uh, but before that, the whole Law & Order thing, he was like down on himself and kind of giving people the creeps with how upset he was at how things turned out for him. But he actually, in June 2005, went to the... April 2005, went to the Tribeca Film Festival. And there was a documentary on TV Party, which was the New York City TV show he played the accordion on after he got fired from SNL. Um, oh, okay. And so they were doing like this whole documentary and invited all the people who were ever involved in it over and when he went he had the plan to interview people on the red carpet as the rocket report and so he had a rocket report possible tv show in development at that time or trying to get it started so people were like super happy he seemed great on the red carpet on the resurgence a little bit yeah almost comes full circle at that point yes one of his perceived failures in his career yeah, come back might around. come back and be a success boom exactly but his house in canterbury needed a lot of work mm-hmm. so he was working on his home he was feeling the pressure he felt like he was wasting so much time and so much money just trying to keep this place afloat he didn't realize what a huge impact moving to Canterbury, Connecticut would have on his mental state and physical well-being. Um, it just sounds like too much to do. Yeah. Especially if you're trying to work and you're trying to figure things out. Yeah. And in the winter, you got to like, you know, I don't know, do all that it's shit. Rough winter. Winterize it. Yeah. The, the, that's, winters were fucking... Uh, 2005, around that time? Yeah. It was fucking freezing. Yeah. yeah. So he was like stressed that he wasn't getting much work. 
Like, how am I going to support myself? And just wasn't doing well. So he had like a, he ended up just putting up a tent in the yard and just like going out there and just like chilling out. And his wife thought was just like, oh, it's just like his quiet time. Yeah. Um, but he was really preparing himself for the worst. Uh oh. Yeah. Quiet time. <laughs> yes. Yikes. Yeah. No good. That's yeah. just Charlie in the yard. Yeah, anytime <laughs> someone needs quiet time, yeah. it means they're a little bit disturbed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got to take the demons outside with them. Yeah. Why is daddy hitting his head on a block right now? Because the, the devil's in his head. <laughs> Why is he trying to cut off his own thumb on a stump? <laughs> well, he was taught that. That was from ham. Who's Ham? Why are you? Why is the so devil's in his thumb? Ham. <laughs> ham. So he told a friend, um, "I'm thinking of killing myself before all this happened." Some people call that a cry for help. Some people do. Some would. But his friend thought that he was joking. Pretty on the nose. They were. I mean, that's a funny bit, right? <laughs> hey, I'm gonna hey, kill hey. myself. Yeah, they <laughs> were. They were in a bar and drinking together, and so he was just like chalking it up to him being like drunk and funny. Yeah. Wow. But it was really him saying, I'm going to kill myself. Right? And he was hoping his friend would be like, wait, really? Instead of like, ah, that's hilarious, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so cutting your throat has been done is okay. what, what this says. What says? The blind item. Oh, okay. There's been real pictures on the internet. They all show cuts in the middle of the throat where the Adam's apple is. And then there's just, you know. Just to clarify, you're saying this is how he killed himself? Somewhat. Yes. Okay. So when you cut your throat, it's usually, you know, boom, stab right in the middle where the Adam's apple is, and then, you know, kind of move it around from there. A Colombian ne- necktie, as they call it. A Colombian <laughs> necktie, right? That's good, Mark. <laughs> you never heard of heard, that? I haven't heard that one. It is true. That's what they call it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on here. Okay, so on his last day, Charlie was, uh, you know, really mulling around. Um, Milling around. No, mulling. Oh, he's just thinking about a lot of stuff. He's okay. thinking about. You are correct. Thinking about this documentary he had to do the next day. So right now we're October 7th, 2005. And October 8th, 2005, he was booked to do an SNL documentary, which he agreed to do reluctantly. So they wanted to mm. interview him and do like a talking head thing about. You know, what happened to you? Yeah. Wh- <laughs> Where did everything go wrong? Yeah. Why are you shit in your life shit? Yeah. So add that to the all the 90s where, you know, the career was doing well and then all of a sudden really cools off and everything that he did get was kind of like a jab at him. Yeah. Almost. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said on Law and Order, he's like, does anyone know who I am even? Yeah. So he it's, really feels like he's n- a non-entity. It's, so, it's interesting to me that his career started in like kind of a meta way in which he submitted his tape of like, f- you know, making fun of newscasting. And that's how he got his job. Yeah. And at the end, he's doing a Law and Order where it's meta making fun of him once being like a, a known actor. Somebody. Somebody. Yeah. Well, the Law and Order wasn't necessarily making fun of him in that just way. Just the dialogue. It's it's ju- just, it just happened to be that it's way. It's just that for a depressed guy to do movies. He picks things, up on everything. Yeah, he just to assumes do things it has like, something to do with him. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing what we know now, when you see that clip, he's like, I'm not suicidal. Yeah. So if I was not to give it away, but come on. If I <laughs> yeah. was super depressed, like all of a sudden I like I look at your Packer shirt and I, I reference it to the 1996 Super Bowl where the Patriots lost and I broke with my girlfriend and I'm like, oh, yeah, he's wearing that shirt on purpose or something. Exactly. It just has nothing to do yeah. with it. But if you're looking for bad shit, you're going to find it. They called me in for this role because they saw me as a washed up. Exactly. Loser. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so he's not doing well. He's really not looking forward to this interview. And so his wife said he went out walking at night around the uh, the estate. And it seemed like something was really burdening him. So she was like, you know what? He'll just walk around. He'll walk it off. He'll go to his tent. Everything will be fine. Not the case. Spoiler alert. Uh-oh. Um, so he went to the barn and he was wearing his reading glasses. And they actually found his reading glasses on top of his toolbox. And I think it's significant because it was just like, you know, that's the last time he's going to really see in full, full vision. He's putting it on the toolbox and he actually took out two knives from the toolbox and went out into his driveway and 
cut both sides of his neck across. Oh, my God. That's why they said it was like such a brutal way to go because usually when someone cuts their neck, it's in the middle and that's it. But he made sure he did. Uh, there were two three-inch uh, incisions on both sides of his neck, so he got both arteries on each side of his neck. Man. And so he had researched this. He knew what he yeah. was doing. Yeah, that was the thing. It was like... They even said um, they looked up his browser history, and he did look it up on the internet. Ugh. Yeah, um, of how course. to do it. So, but wow. you, you've got to be filled with a lot. It's of a Canterbury necktie. Hatred, self hatred. Canterbury necktie. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Too dark. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just a tad. Um, they said it was one of the most brutal suicides. The police and EMTs that showed up, um, they took pictures, but they've never been released. Yeah, yeah, who would want to see those photos? A lot of people. I don't like looking at shit like that. I tried to look them up, but yeah. it's uh, you can't find it. Sealed. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's really just a curiosity thing. Yeah. It's got to be the most brutal suicide. Yeah. That's just got to hurt. Um, <laughs> That's got to hurt. And you got to know that it, it's happening for at least a few seconds before you pass out from blood loss. Really? Well, yeah. It's like it's not instant. Oh, I no, like, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, that I really. That's crazy. That's really disturbing. How long do you reckon he was alive? Um, I would say physically conscious, probably less than ten seconds. Okay, so it's quick. That's yeah, insane. but that's still 10 One, seconds. Seems like an, an eternity two, when it's that bad. Three, four, ten. <laughs> yeah, you wish. <laughs> he just said, Ham! Ham! I'm coming for you, Ham! <laughs> Suddenly he's in heaven with Ham. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if Ham's going to heaven. Not all Ham's going to heaven. <laughs> He's in heaven. All hams go yeah. to heaven. He's like, where's ham? <laughs> <laughs> Getting cooked down below. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's finally yeah, he's, he's finally a proper Easter ham <laughs> Sizzling. in hell. <laughs> yeah. So the really sad thing is his wife was walking the dog in the morning, and that's how she found him. Oh my god! So he was out overnight, just gone. And nobody knew because it was in a state where you can't hear your kids scream. Yeah. And he had done that before, like that was went a sales in, pitch. Slept in the tent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, so she, was she just thought like, it was one of his nights. Yeah, he'll be okay. He'll come back in, and everything will be fine. Fuck. It was not. Yeah. Wow. Yep. What a horrific thing to find in the. Oh morning. my god! Not yeah. only that, so she has to call nine one one. The police, EMTs, everybody shows up. It's a crime scene, pretty much. You know, they figure out, obviously, it's suicide pretty quick. But as this is all happening, the limousine uh, that was going to take him for to, NPR, to yeah. New York City. Was NPR for the a SNL. limousine? No, wow. SNL. Oh, okay, The SNL okay, documentary okay. Oh, okay, yeah. that he was going to do the next day. The limousine showed up to pick him up, and he was dead. Yeah, imagine who has wow. to tell them to like what happened. That's a really fucked up day. You think about the wife just finding him, right? Yeah. Even if it's not her husband and just seeing a corpse like that yeah. with yeah. the throat open, that's traumatic. Mm -hmm. But then it is her husband, so also dealing with she lost her husband. Yeah. And then a limo shows up. And like, to, hey, where's your husband? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, for Mr. Rocket? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's in the morgue. So depressing. I, I, I imagine what Lauren Michaels... He probably thought about it for less than a half a second, but like, you know, what goes through his head? Because he doesn't really have much to do with it, really. He, no, he, he really doesn't. There. No, yeah. Right. The better question is, what's Gene Domanian thinking? Mm. Yeah. In the notes, the uh, death report, is that a thing? Sure. Autopsy report. Yeah. It was noted that he had no hesitation cuts. So it was just all in. Mm. He didn't take one one shot and, and and didn't go through with it. He just did one time. Boom, he's out. When it comes to knives, though, that's like extremely extremely rare. Really? Like uh, there's usually hesitation cuts and like other things going on, like trying to work yourself up to it. Oh my god! So he just went boom. boom. Yeah, that's it. Mm. That'd be a strong guy. Yeah, that really is a 
unnecessarily violent way to go out. Yeah. The self-hatred was that strong Mm -hmm. that it's a different level. He doesn't know what he's doing. Has SNL done anything to like commemorate his death or anything or, or Lauren Michaels or anyone at NBC? No, not as far as I know. Just no reference at all. Not really. Except that the official YouTube channel of SNL posts his clips Oh, do that? Yeah, yeah. Rocket yeah. Reports there, him saying the N-words there. This is a lot. Wait, the <laughs> N-words still on there? Yeah, that's, that's what, what we Kyle played. said earlier. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. That I was from that the part. Saturday Night Live official, official YouTube. YouTube. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's why I was like, this is on the official YouTube, yeah. and they wouldn't let Shane Gillis come on, who said that, uh, some Asian slur in jest yeah. during a bit. Pretty crazy. We're the first podcast to even uncover this and tell people about it. So, Shane, yeah. you're welcome. I, I'm not... I'm not talking about the Shane Gillis thing. <laughs> I'm not touching on that at all. So people are saying, you know, all these acting roles, everything, the house getting underwater with that and stressing out about not working enough. That was all contributing. But it came out that this radio program on the media aired in the early morning of October 7, 2005. And he died in the evening. Mm-hmm. Yes. Wow. Charlie's mentioned so negatively that he was still being gossiped about his SNL mistake 25 years after the fact. He was like a caution sign for everyone else. Yeah. Like, don't do this, or yeah. else, you know... It, it happened again with SNL. Another girl uh, swore, and they got kicked off oh, the show. Oh, several people have. Yeah, yeah. Jenny Slate swore. Jenny Slate, that's what I'm thinking But of. she claims she was fired for other reasons, that they weren't a good fit or something. She's kind of kooky. Yeah. Yeah. So they open the show. Uh, Brooke Gladstone is one of the hosts. She said, this is on the media. I'm Brooke Gladstone. Bob Garfield says, and I'm Bob Garfield. Former SNL cast member Charles Rocket didn't leave much of a mark on comedy, but nevertheless entered the annals of live TV when he was fired in 1981 for blurting out a very naughty word in the middle of Weekend Update, which is wrong. It wasn't Weekend Update. It was Who Shot JR. Yeah, Yeah, it it was during the closing, Yeah, the goodbyes. Um, Fake media. Fake and then news. he makes a joke about somebody being the Charles Rocket of college football. So it wasn't even a story about Charles Rocket. Yeah. And they're just using him as a punchline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he ends up dead that day. Might I add that I used to listen to a lot more NPR. And I would listen to On the Media sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Boy, is that a smug show. Mm. Ugh, you almost want to throw up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so smug. And I, I don't know. I don't really listen to that much NPR anymore. I used to. Like when yeah. it was on 88.9 and 8.9 or something, I used to enjoy like they did cool indie media like yeah. blocks and stuff. And the news sometimes, Jim Lehrer, I guess, yeah. was good. But NPR is kind of weird these days. I don't and, know. and I can just imagine. I'm not going on some like Tucker Carlson rant or right. anything. Right. <laughs> But I could just imagine him hearing that, hearing that broadcast where they're making fun of him. Like, who the fuck are they? Yeah. And just being completely destroyed mentally hearing that. Right. I mean, we don't know if he officially heard it, but I think it's pretty obvious. That is no coincidence that he killed himself later that day. Yeah. That's what you do when you're, you know, living in rural uh, Connecticut. You listen to NPR yeah. and you hang out on the, you know, on your farm or whatever you got going on there. You do composting. Like he was probably <laughs> listening to that. God, can't even imagine. Poor Charlie. And then SNL does nothing to commemorate him. That's crazy. Yeah. It's amazing who got fired from that show, like Chris Farley and Adam Sandler, all the people that got fired and. You know, usually when you're in that atmosphere or that network, they acknowledge you or they know you, some people just really fuck up and then they just do not. Yeah. And I think he's one of those examples. God. And I got a couple of things here. Uh, in 1989, the L.A. Times did a profile called Off Like a Rocket where they interviewed him as his TV career was blossoming. And he said, it's fun to play the bad guys, but it's kind of dangerous, too, in a way, because if you do a good job, then people think you really like that. That's so, it. Yeah. You get pigeonholed as shit. Yeah. And then about the F word, the fuck word thing, <laughs> he said, I wasn't the first to have made that error, that mistake, that totally. slip. Yeah. People who had said that intentionally were heralded as heroes just one year before me. Mm. I bet. So, yeah, that was his take on it. No big deal. And then after his death, 
some random reactions. Chris France from The Talking Heads said that I know that Charlie had some pretty big disappointments in his life. The world of Hollywood movies and television can be pretty rough for a person. Yeah. And then Jim Emerson, who used to blog on Roger Ebert's site, and he actually co-wrote It's Pat, the movie. He said that the AP devoted nine paragraphs to Rocket, and four of them referred to the incident. The first line of his IMDb entry is, once uttered the F word live on Saturday Night Live. In some way, I think he must have known that would be the stupid piece of trivia that followed him to his grave. Mm. Yeah. If it bleeds, it leads. That's that's the uh, thing. And then Julia Sweeney, who obviously worked with him in It's Pat, said that he always seemed so happy. His wife, Beth, was always warm and conversational, a real glow by his side. And it makes me think that maybe I didn't know him all that well, that he could have killed himself. And it makes me wish I'd spent more time around him. Mm. And then I got one final reaction from, apparently this was his best friend, the actor Joe Pantoliano Mm -hmm. from The Matrix. He officiated their wedding. Joey Pants. Yeah. Joey Pants. And he said, I loved Charlie. And the way he took his life and the way that I had only spoken to him two days before when we made plans for Thanksgiving. When that happened, it just knocked me off my center. And I felt a great feeling of empathy that literally scared the shit out of me because I thought that Charlie had found the answer. And that was the answer for me, too. Mm. So he had to confront his own depression after Charlie killed himself. Wow. Joey Pants, great. You know, Sopranos, Matrix, very insightful guy. Yeah. Rest in yeah. peace. Rest Charles in peace, Rocket. Charles Rocket. Wow. Man. Um, all right, guys. Any other things to add on here, Kyle? Any in your in your book of encyclopedic knowledge of the death of Charlie Rocket? Anything else? Man deserved a hug. Yeah. That's all I got. That would have solved it. Yeah. Just one hug. One hug. From Lauren Michaels. No, it's good. And uh, a real quick note is literally after we finished recording our In Memoriam Part 2 last week, a second later, Meatloaf died and oh, right. Louis yeah. Anderson died. Yes. Which we will be covering. Yeah. yeah. It was a very odd thing. We're aware of it. Yeah. And we're going to be reporting on it. We'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. Yeah. Follow us on Instagram at Death and Entertainment. On Twitter at Dipod. 2021. Even though it's a different year. Also, <laughs> YouTube, Death and Entertainment. A lot of good a stuff. A lot of good Morgan's stuff. Board, yep. And uh, related videos, related content that yes. will enhance your viewing <laughs> pleasure. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, sex line worker. Mm. Here, you know. <laughs> mm. I just want to know who the fuck shot me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that will be up there. Yep. Uh, him saying the N word very loud will probably not be on there. But the, <laughs> the, the fuck word will be, though. Yeah. Yeah, the fuck word will. Yeah. N word, no. Yeah. yeah. Well, that I think does it. That does it. Thanks for another week, you guys. We got it. We got it in the can this time. We got it, it. We baby. Got it. Is it plugged in? <laughs> I hope Kyle? so. Everything's plugged in, and we record. Wait a second, <laughs> Kyle. Put those knives down. By the way, audience, <laughs> you just heard what we recorded. Yep. Imagine we did that once already. And plus gold, another hour. And then, gold that you're listening to. And then afterwards, Kyle's like, "Oh my god, it wasn't plugged in." Who unplugged it? Yeah. <laughs> Which one of you scoundrels? Yeah. Because it wasn't me. It's a conspiracy. But we did it this time. Hooray. Hooray. All right. You're welcome. Adios. Bye, guys. Bye. You have just heard... A true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. The movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon.